Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind to both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to Biz Simply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. And Biz Simply is the all-in-one HR, workforce management, road and operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, to how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long-term, not just survive. I don't think we can leave it down to people making the right choice. We feel it's our sector's responsibility to move the dial. And so context is key, but within context, whether you're talking about a steak restaurant, a fast food restaurant, or a vegan restaurant, we all have the responsibility to move the dial and navigate towards a lower carbon future. And that's at the heart of what Zedible does. This is Ed Brown and Griff Holland, founders of Sedible. Sedible is a fantastic platform that helps to map and track carbon from the supply chain for food and hospitality businesses. They make carbon reduction a hardcore KPI in your business. And I was extremely excited to have this conversation with two mavericks that have always shown the way for how hospitality businesses can be a force for good. We start off the conversation talking about that 90% of the emission in hospitality and food businesses is actually happening on the plate. We also discuss why they as hospitality operators themselves set up Sedible to help the wider industry to reduce emission as well optimize resources. We also explore how much carbon we actually as hospitality businesses can reduce we also dive into their key learnings in building the platform as well as running cafes simultaneously. And I can tell you there's some interesting insights into what they've learned about their businesses and the changes they made. We also discuss the most significant challenges for the industry now and in the future and how to solve them. There's also a huge amount of entrepreneurial learnings to be shared in this conversation. If you like today's episode, it will mean the world to me if you could leave a review of the show on our website, Apple Podcasts or Spotify. The better the reviews, the better the guest, and ultimately, better learning for you. Now, over to this week's episode. Enjoy. Today's conversation is going to take us on a journey to understand really what drives carbon in food and drink purchases, but also in a in a in a restaurant and hospitality setting. And actually, also what we're going to turn on is like how can that actually improve your, of course, bottom line? You know, saving the planet doesn't need just to cost money; it can actually also be maybe good business. So for that, actually, uh, we have actually, and I said that to, to Griff before we started, and he has his uh, co-founder Ed with him today as well from Sedible. Uh, I said, like, welcome back to the show. You actually released the first episode, Hostility Maverick Show, back in 2018. And we are now almost 200 episodes further, and we actually more than 200 bonus episodes. So yeah, with that said, it's great pleasure to have you both here, uh, Ed and Griff. Welcome to the show and welcome back again, Griff. Thanks so much, Michael. Great great to be back. Great to see you again. Yeah, thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to have the time to, to talk about our, our new platform. Yeah, and, and it was great to, to, to see Griff again because the first thing he said to me is like, oh, Michael, man, wow, you got a lot of gray hair in that beard since I saw the last time. So I just know what, we're going to have a great conversation because there's nothing's going to be hidden, you know, straight in there uh, and reminded me actually how fast time goes. And so, yeah, so 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 with that said, like people that hasn't listened in to episode number one can go and do that then they will definitely get a more deep down into the past of your story but i can could you just give the the audience like what what is the story and where how do you end it up with Sedible, which we'll come back to 
is your new platform that's going to revolutionize uh, carbon and uh, the industry. Of course, yeah. Well, it's been quite a journey, Michael. Um, I guess we we got together um, as business partners back in uh, 2009, and we founded a company called Friska. Um, it sat within the sort of quick service restaurant sector, um, and we set out to to build a company that ultimately we were really proud of, um, and that pr- pride was sort of driven uh, from our ethics, you know, the things that we did, the choices that we made to, 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 to run and grow that business, whether it meant our sort of sourcing policy of ingredients, our waste policy, the way we employed people, um, and just creating a, you know, a feel-good company. Our strap line was feel-good food. But in our minds, what we were building was a feel-good uh, company within the hospitality sector. Um, as I said, that was back in 2009, and we, we, we did an awful lot that we were very proud of uh, with each other and with, with a number of colleagues. Um, along the way, we, we won some awards within the sort of context of um, uh, sustainability. So we won a society award with the Sustainable Restaurant Association, and we actually went on to win a Observer Food Monthly Award for Best Ethical Restaurant. Um, I think the interesting thing is the way that sustainability and responsible business uh, and the conversation around it has changed over the years. Um, I should I should add, unfortunately for us, uh, we picked a sector, uh, basically breakfast and lunch for the um, office worker market. And uh, I'm sure everyone listening will understand uh, the impact that COVID had uh, and the boardroom became the bedroom uh, our customers disappeared, and unfortunately, Frisco went into administration. But the journey was a great one. Um, and then, just sort of circling back to the point I was about to make, sustainability and being a responsible sort of company for good was re- was really focused around. Uh, well, it started off in terms of free range meat. Frankly, if it was free range chicken. That was a big tick around sustainability. Um, Over the years, uh, with programs like Green Planet or Blue Planet, um, plastic came into the conversation very heavily. Um, I was often having to substantiate why we we serve things in plastic cups as opposed to biodegradable cups. That's another story, one that I stand behind, but that's another story. But I think the elephant in the room for our first business at Frisca uh, was very much carbon, and that's something which you know now everyone can see the elephant. But for the first sort of eight years or so of our journey in hospitality, carbon wasn't really mentioned. Now it very much is, and 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 sort of perhaps that leads us on to chapter two, which is all around Zedible and helping the hospitality sector decarbonize. Yeah, and tell us about Sedible and how you actually got to from you know running cafes and you're still still running, you're still operating two cafes, as I understand, and actually thinking now, okay, we know what to do now. We know how to get the I love the phrase of making the the elephant stand out in the room uh, with with Sedible. And how do you got to that? It would have to be a tech platform because you are you know hospitality operators. Yeah, so I mean, as Griff mentioned, you know when we and the context, I guess, we would never have been working on Zedible if it hadn't been for our experience as operators with Frisca. Um, you know, and things have moved on a lot, as, as Griff just mentioned, you know, even to the point where it was really CSR and now it's the ESG, which is the um, the sort of the, the label that, it, that it's attached to. So we had this knowledge of what sustainability was in, in businesses, but things have moved on. So this idea of carbon actually, you know, accounting for sort of, 80 90 percent of the impact of hospitality and food businesses so you know that that's why we call the elephant it's the elephant on the plate or the elephant in the room sorry because the carbon is on the plate um the thing that led us to to stop uh, zedible is particularly around the time of cop 26 a lot of stories from the sector around various companies missions to get to net zero by whether it's 2030 or 40 or 50 um Understandably, COP27 was much less on the agenda, much less in the news than COP26 due to all the other factors that have come around with the war in Ukraine, etc. But COP26, a lot of coverage around this. And 
you know, with our sustainable sort of business hat on and an appreciation for sort of systems and, and technology that, that we had applied to our uh, previous business, we, ch- we thought, well, how are these companies going to sort of navigate this journey? How are they going to actually make this a reality? And we started to look at, I guess, what was in the market. And you've got two main ways that you try and do this. You'd l- use a carbon accounting approach, which is looking at spend by supplier and then giving a, a, a sort of benchmark around that and then all the other options around carbon labeling those are the two things that people talk about and we just thought for various reasons neither of those really would help the operator and i guess we really looked at this from an operator's perspective help you pull the levers and move the dial and that's that's why we set about building the platform um, to try and give operators like us the tool that we would want to go and you know use to to go on that journey and um when did you know it was like you know a platform where do you how did you get to that because i guess you were were you thinking platform for from day one or were you thinking like we need to get them a calculator whatever what, what were you thinking when you had that idea because i think it's very very well uh seen that actually how we're we actually going to measure this and actually how we're we actually going to be to be able also be totally transparent about it so it's not just some kind of you know finger in the air kind of number yeah i think we, we started to look at you know from a data perspective what, what's out there how, how do you how do you achieve this how do you start building it up and what's the, what's the core functionality and, and i think what is really important is to be able to understand the changes that you might be well, understanding where you can make changes and how those changes will be sort of manifest in reducing co2 in, in the company because of all that embodied carbon from the purchasing. So it, it, it becomes a platform, not a calculator, because it needs to tie in. It needs to really be um, like linked to your trading, your, your P&L. You need to have, if you're going to take it serious, a, a product that helps you align CO2 to your um, P&L ultimately. Um, and so that's the... I guess that that's how we ended up looking at it as a as a platform because this need to make it sort of joined up, I guess, between these two two sides of it. Michael, would it be useful if we I just sort of briefly sort of summarised why we felt that the existing tools wouldn't really serve us as operators in terms of navigating towards that carbon reduction target? Yeah, I think that, that's a beautiful uh, question or statement. Yeah, we we need to dive into because like why is it that there wasn't anything available in the current setup yeah i mean i think in 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 hospitality and ingredients the devil is in the detail so if you're buying like a homogenous product let's say paper if i buy it from supplier you know 100 pounds worth of of paper from a supplier a b or c they're all going to have roughly the same amount of carbon okay they're not very different uh products there isn't there's not a huge amount of detail but if you were to, let's say, as a consumer, go to the supermarket and spend £100, the carbon impact of that purchase will be dramatically different based on what you're actually buying. So you could go to the supermarket and spend £100 worth of chickpeas or £100 worth of beef. That makes a difference. Whereas carbon accounting absolutely has its place, but not where the detail matters. So that's why we didn't feel it was right for our sector. The second thing which has been received warmly and less warmly in different uh, businesses and with different customer bases is around carbon labelling. Now, we're not for a moment suggesting that, that more knowledge around carbon is a bad thing. It's not. What we question is, does it really drive the change that your consumers say they will do? So if you ask a customer, would you like to have more information about carbon? Unless you're speaking to Cyril Sneer or like an evil person, they're only going to answer that question one way, right? It's like, yes, I would like to have more information about carbon. Follow-up question, would it inform your decision? Again, there is only one reasonable answer to that question. Of course it would. Unfortunately, what we say and what we do are two different things. And so when confronted with choice, we buy what we want. 
as opposed to what we should buy. Now, that's not me sort of denigrating consumers and saying everyone should go vegan. It's not. It's just saying I know what I'm like. You know, I look at a tub of haagen and I know it's got too many calories. And you were kind enough not to say that I'd put on weight since we last met. I told you about your grey hairs. You didn't say <laughs> you're looking, your cheeks are looking bigger. But I know full well that that tub of haagen has got too many calories. But once in a you know, I will still eat it. So what I say and what I do are two different things. And for something as important as carbon at a company level, at a global level, we, I don't think we can leave it down to people making the right choice. We feel it's the operator's responsibility. It is our sector's responsibility to move the dial. And so context is key. But within context, whether you're talking about a steak restaurant a fast food restaurant or a vegan restaurant, we all have the responsibility to move the dial uh, and navigate towards a lower carbon future. And that is absolutely, that's at the heart of what Zedible does. You know, one of the questions you asked us is, um, what is our mission at Zedible? And simply put, it's to decarbonize the food sector. It's a short sentence, it's a massive uh, ambition and if we can be a part of that, then I think, you know, we can we can we can feel good about what the next chapter is for us, really. Well, I think, I think the next relevant question is then because like was it? Yeah, I was almost thinking, what is the ambition? And you said it yourself there. But can you give an example of how that's going to work? We already talked about that. You really the elephant in the room is the food on the plate and your ingredients. So try to take us through an example of, you know, two dishes in a restaurant and let's compare them and say if we think impact, how we actually think about it in the term of that. So I think if we use our, our own hospitality business, so as you, as you said, we're still operators, but at, at a smaller scale. We, we have been using this platform in our own business, which is called Double Puck, for you know, 12 months, uh, over 12 months of data in, in the platform now. I guess the things that, that we see coming from our data have surprised us that our biggest contributor for our business is our coffee. So our roasted espresso bean. Now, you know, we're not, we don't sell a lot of meat, but we, you know, we have made a change within our business around um, uh, sort of purchasing uh, lamb and beef, but coffee is the biggest one. So it's coffee, milk, cheese, that those are the big ones for our business. Now I wouldn't have guessed that if I didn't have that, no, no way. Um, what that means is that you can start to understand more around your supply base, our supply that supplies us coffee. How do they operate? How can we then articulate the good things they're doing into that kilo of coffee that we, we purchase? Um, so that's one thing. I think, again, looking at our actual purchasing volumes, and that, that's how the platform is, is uh, presents it back, looks at the detail, the granularity in your purchasing applies the carbon to it and shows you how that looks. We've got an opportunity, which actually we actioned last week, to look at substituting our full fat milk for semi-skimmed milk. So semi-skimmed milk has 23% less CO2 than full fat milk. Now, we've got the ability to sort of change the way that the customer engages with us. So the default option as of last week is that customers have semi-skimmed and on request we can give them that full fat milk option now we buy a non-homogenized um, milk so it foams well in terms of the espresso and doesn't you know impact the customer experience and i think that's the there's two examples of like understanding actually a product that i would have never have guessed like coffee is the top of our list and number two how can we take our second highest which is milk and make a big impact and you know reduce the impact of that product by you know 23 percent without impacting the customer experience protecting our gross profit margin and not impacting revenue and i think that's that's the way that we look at the world it's this idea that the commercial and the carbon um, conversation are very disparate at the moment it feels and you need a, a, a place to bring those two things and look at them through the same lens and that's what we think we're able to achieve uh, and that's why we think we can have hopefully a big impact because we're not uh, immune to, to knowing you have to look at those two factors it's not just one 
Yeah, and I guess also it's such a complex conversation. What you do with that, suddenly you take individual products out you will be focusing on and actually understanding because most people will say it will be meat. You know, meat is the sinner in this and it might not be the meat the sinner in your specific business depending on what really drives the sale in a way. Um, and also, I guess, what can you then see also when you go back because you said you went back to the supplier is that then to find out how has that product acted? What is the journey of that product exactly from transport to production and so on? Yeah, exactly. What it, what it does is we, through the, through the way that we're presenting the data, it shows you really what you need to care about as a, as a, as a food business. So I often talk about, you know, we've been to clients, we buy carrots in our, our business. It's one of the you know common products that we use. We do a lot of slaw and things like that, but it's in an actual from an emissions perspective, it is not important to us as a business. So it's not in our top 100 SKUs in terms of carbon. So in the nicest possible way, I don't care about carrots. I don't care about anything about carrots because it's not important. So what what the platform does as us for us as operators is focus our attention. And so you know that you know I'm not going to start digging into the source of our carrots and anything about that. But I am going to look into how Clifton Coffee, where we buy our coffee, how that is better than the generic assumption around coffee and a coffee supplier. And that's the how that's where you can start to then um, put a spotlight in the good things that are being done all over the sector, whether that's from the supplier base, from individual brands, because you've got the you can quantify it and you have a data point. I think that's that's what is is, is often lacking in these conversations. If they're not data led in that way and that's how you can get you can start to see the impact as well at the moment michael just to uh, jump in there at the moment i would generally say that our sector and the broader sector right the food sector so yes hospitality but yes corporate catering mm-hmm. yes public sector catering and these are these are sort of subsections <coughs> that have very very ambitious carbon reduction goals universities are typically Put their flag on the mask saying that they are going to go net zero by 2030 amazing we applaud that the visibility within the sector is complete blindness we've not yet met any clients that have any visibility around what's driving their carbon from an ingredient perspective the biggest danger i think our sector has is to ed's point is saying, oh yeah, but I'm gonna. I, I don't think this is the right uh, platform for me, or I don't think that the data is relevant for me because um, they're not my carrots. <clears throat> to Ed's point, within the context of Double Puck Cafe, carrots are irrelevant. Focus on coffee. Focus on milk. Focus on cheddar cheese. Those are the things that are going to make a difference. And so, uh, I think a real danger in the broader sort of sustainability uh, conversation globally, never mind just sort of sector focus, is that it's so easy to get hung up on my carrots, my tomato, that you never start the journey. Starting the journey is the first part, and Zedible gives operators a map to navigate towards a carbon reduction <clears throat> ambition. And over time, they can focus in on the things that really matter for them. And that's how we're going to get to wherever we all want to get to yeah because then uh, i was thinking exactly the same because we're just working in blindness then we're just working on you know small projects it doesn't really matter and then at some end the time runs out for that and we haven't really moved the needle I, and i actually come to my next question because how much because you want to you know you really want to transform something here but how much carbon can we actually reduce out of the hospitality business how much an impact can we do because there's these massive ambition, you know, on a global level, also sector level, this is what we want to reduce. But how much is actually possible? Do you have an idea from, I know you only looked at your own business and now you're scaling up with clients as well and the data set, but what, what is the opportunity here? There's a, there's a couple of things that are interesting on this. So there, there was a really, really good and very detailed um, research paper that Zero Carbon Forum released probably a couple of years ago, within the last two years going through a really detailed view specifically on hospitality. But they're, they're sort of, to sort of paraphrase uh, the, the 
their view on it. I guess that they saw a 60% reduction in CO2 possible over the next 10 years. So I guess, what, you know, the art of the possible, 60% reduction over the next 10 years. They were a mix of um, custom behavior change um, from menu engineering and from the impact of your own supplier base. And I guess that is, you know, that's great. That'd be a massive, you know, I couldn't tell you now what that equates to in terms of kilos of carbon, but that is a huge um, impact if, if something like that. But, you know, again, I'll come back to what you need is the ability to see the manifestation of these changes aligns your trading. Then it has, then it's important that, 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 you know, we talk about that a lot, this idea of aligning it to, to your p &L. So that's the art of the possible. Um, and, uh, you know, another interesting fact, just to sort of give the scale, is that the, a, a research by the uh, public catering, a uh, public sector catering magazine, did a couple, again, a couple of years ago, saying that 2.1 billion meals a year are uh, produced in the public sector. Essentially, one in four people they said are fed by the public sector. So this is a huge opportunity to have a big, big impact. And it's where there's a real touch point with people because, you know, people are consuming this. And that, that I think that's the, the opportunity to, to try and learn from all of the, the smart things that, whether it's a public sector caterer through to a, you know, grand restaurant and everywhere in between, what people are doing and see how this is moving the dial in the right direction. And that's, um, yeah, what, what we think is the, is the powerful thing about what, what we're working on. And it also make, it makes the, the sort of uh, the impact achievable. Like when you open up the papers, you know, you're sort of confronted with this sort of narrative that the world needs to buy EVs. Now, you know, my last business went into administration. I can't afford a bloody Tesla, Michael. <laughs> what I can do, what I can do and what I have started doing is as a, uh, buying semi-skimmed milk at home because I know that it's got 23% less carbon than full fat milk. So, you know, this these sorts of changes are very empowering, both at a you know, business level, operator level, but also at a consumer level. You know, you don't need to become vegan to make things better. I'm sure that will annoy some of your listeners now, um, but that's just reality. If we were to say, right, our cafe is going to go vegan from tomorrow, I can guarantee you we'll be closed within a month. That's just reality. So I can either rage against the machine into the next administration, or I can say, right, what can I do within the context that I have to drive change? And it's a really empowering thing really empowering, you know, because operators, businesses, institutions do not know where to start. They have their eyes closed. And what I find so uh, inspiring about our platform is that it gives visibility to the actions that we can all make that don't uh, erode margin, don't detract customer experience, you know, they fundamentally support and drive the commercial success of businesses whilst navigating towards a, a lower carbon future. And that's, I think, someone something that everyone would sort of strive strive to do yeah and i think i think that's just, it made me also think like it's also almost like when you win know where you're going you can almost like every day improve you can almost like set some very clear goals like the one percent at one percent at one percent 30 higher 37 times better in the end of the year and I guess that's also why suddenly visibility. What about that visibility you've done in your own business? And have you communicated that to the customers as well? Because again, it's also an education piece. You suddenly know what makes the difference, what makes the dial go in the right direction. Have you used that up to now said like, well, we have made this choice that means that we have produced blah, 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 or that's still to come? Well, it's interesting. We have made a couple of big, changes as in in terms of changes that, that, that have or will have a big impact on carbon but we haven't actually used that as a as a messaging tool that's just purely our you know internally that's just what we've done, we've done it we haven't impacted the you know revenues haven't impacted margin or, or the experience as a result but we've just done it i guess and so one thing that we we stopped selling lamb meatballs and we changed that product for a uh, plant protein um but not, you know, sold on, we've made this big change, you know, let, let's shout about it, rightly or wrongly, that's just our approach. And that's had a massive impact. That's reduced our carbon intensity uh, by a third, very high 
um, carbon uh, sort of level for, for lamb and it was a big seller and we've that, that's the level of impact that's happened that's had on our business and we can we can see that we can see that our baseline is now significantly lower than it was when we were selling that that product before so it's great to have that a real data point the other thing that, that I, I mentioned it around the semi skimmed to whole milk that's something that we action just now so we want to see the impact of that in our own business and i'm expecting that to start lowering our carbon intensity you know in january and certainly in february and then we sort of move on to the next um, thing, which is probably looking at a blend of margarine and butter in our cookies, because we, we uh, make a lot of cookies in our business and some of our products. And so I guess our approach is this, and you sort of touched on this idea of incremental gains. Rather than just looking at a long list of 100 products and say, where do I start? Working through it logically, well, we can do that. We can test, does it work? Does it not? You know, is the product still great? Okay, let's try it. Let's see the impact of it, and then let's move on to the next thing. All these will have a compound in, impact, and and they will, you know, they are starting to reduce our baseline CO two. So that is averting carbon from going into to the atmosphere. So there's a lot of talk. At least, you know, we've started to to hear much more about scope four, which is this idea of what carbon you're averting and reporting on the scope four. Now, now this is this is all around that. It's like what are we doing to avert carbon? Because we're now running a more efficient operation from a carbon perspective. Even if we double the size of the business, we're running we're better than we would have been because we made these changes. I think just to chip in there with a couple of other points, um, I mean, Double Park is a much smaller business, mm, yeah. uh, Michael, than, than Frisker was. Back in the day at Frisker, we would have been talking about all of the you know wonderful things we were doing. Our main business is very much Zedical. We, 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 we love hospitality. We want to uh, retain our sort of uh, connection with, with, you know, ultimately our customers, our clients in the context of Zedible. And so uh, and that's how we do that with, with, with Double Puck. I would say some interesting points in terms of value driven from those changes, because for us, it's been less on the social media and the sort of uh, marketing channels, although I think it would resonate very well. Um has been internally. So when I talk to the guys about um, the changes we're making at an ingredient level and why we're doing them, A, they've been staggered, so their eyes have been opened as well, and B, they've been really pleased that we are working towards, uh, you know, a, a, a lower carbon uh, future as a company. So that's, that's a big um, win. Um, and, 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 that, and those sorts of good vibes, you know, they, they, they permeate out. So they'll be talking to their friends about, oh, double puck is, is great. We, you know, we reduced our carbon by a third in the last year. And, you know, when you're talking about Gen Z, I think we're into Gen Alpha now. I mean, we're, we're old dogs, aren't we, uh, Michael? So, but, uh, these, these sorts of messages absolutely resonate with the, 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 the existing and, you know, future workforces and consumers. I was having a uh, coffee yesterday with a friend of mine who is the CEO of an organization called Neighborly, and they sort of focus on the S in ESG. Uh, they've got partnerships with uh, Marks & Spencer, Audi, and Lidl. Apparently, bringing Audi and Lidl into the same thing is uh, quite a feat. So what they're doing is, uh, yeah. is, 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 is good. It's moving the dial. And they said the reason that these big companies are, are getting on board is to attract and retain talent. So it has value, absolutely, over and above the commercials. And then the third point, because I know I'm starting to waffle now, is more in the context of uh, corporate catering. You know, if you're if you're catering for uh, Ernst & Young, KPMG, PwC, et cetera, they're all going to have their carbon reduction targets, ambitions. And as a provider of a service to them in food, in hospitality, you are going to be a part of that journey for them. They're going to realize their ambition by you doing a better job. And so it's absolutely resonating on the catering side of things and actually is part of a, a tendering process within the context of universities. Universities are saying if you want to serve food at our campuses and to us, you need to have a rigorous and quantitative 
carbon reduction strategy. And that's what we bring, right? See, make CO2 an API. That's what we do. Take, taking into account that this sounds like this is, this is brilliant, that we need to do this. And also, we just touch a bit on the challenge in the industry, which you also, I guess, feels in a way as still as operator and, you know, the current challenge versus carbon emission. What is your view on where we are as an industry? A lot have happened. You told your story with Friska as well and, and so on. Lots have happened since COVID broke out in principle. But what are the challenges right now? I'd say, you know, just as a side note, I don't think it's ever been such a, you take the last three years or whatever it's been, have been such a period of um, shock of, of, across every front um, than there has been now. I mean, the, the, I'd say as operators, our biggest concerns are just purely with an operational head around energy uh, costs. Um, that is really significant and is, you know, you would never have believed it three years ago that that's the level of, of energy price. And obviously, you know, this is a manifestation of, of bigger things going on, but how it, how it hits the sort of p and it's massive. Um, and cost of living, I guess, is the sort of threat around dampening demand and, and putting more pressure on sales and like likes and so on. So they, I'd say right now, you know, those have gone right to the top of the agenda. What I would say is, you know, climate the climate challenge crisis, however way you sort of describe it, hasn't gone away. You know, and I think last summer in particular was a real eye for a lot of people of just the the increasing intensity and manifestation of of what you know some people have been talking about for decades. That sort of seems like it's really coming home to roost now. So I would say from a that they are the biggest direct costs, but there's this idea that that is not gone away, that the planet is getting, you know, warmer, faster, and you know, there needs to be a sort of combined effort from everyone that's running a business and in a position to make a change to, to, to get on board. And, and that leads me to, to the, to the, actually to the next question that really ties in with this. Like, so, so what you guys has been on since 2009 on that mission to build a business as a force for good, what the, you know, how do we do that? You know, and what what is the what is the best advice in these times? Because lots of people are talking about, as you just said, cost and money and survival. I think it's disempowering to always think of you, your sector, your colleagues as the problem, right? So we can be the problem, or we can be the force for good. And so I think what to, to sort of change the mindset. And, and the sort of uh, lens that we put on our sector. We need to think of uh, food and the hospitality sector as being a force for positive change in the cri- climate challenge that we're all going to be a part of. Um, once you sort of change your sort of mindset as opposed to, oh, crikey, we're the bad guys, as opposed to, no, we can actually enact positive change, then, then the crucial thing to kind of continue with that sort of forward motion is to have the tools to enact change. And I think that's that's one of the things that's been lacking. And possibly why carbon wasn't on the conversation. Pretty straightforward to get rid of uh, plastic straws in the business. You just stop buying them. Um, it's pretty easy to buy free range meat if your customer base uh, you know, can, can afford to, to buy it. You just start buying free range meat. Actually, if you don't, If you've got no visibility over the carbon, you have no map and compass to help you get to wherever you want to get to. I think now with the sort of insights that are available and, you know, Zedible as as part of that conversation, operators can have the tools that they need to to track towards, you know, a a better future. And so, um, yeah, for me, that's changing the mindset that we're not the bad guys, we, we are a positive force for good in the climate challenge is a really empowering sort of mindset and then and then equipping yourselves with the with the tools the compass the map is absolutely vital to to start change now or last week as we did by switching out full fat milk to semi-skim yeah and i also love that thing about like using actually a positive mind frame, but also like that actually we can actually do a lot of things if we just know where we're going and where we're heading and we have the insights and it comes back to what we talked a bit about a bit earlier. 
but if we take that into um, like building a business as false for good, I also guess that it's necessary in the world we lived in because if the planet explode, there will be no business. There will be nothing else. It will be pure survival in a way. So the only way to stay in business is actually to become a business as a force for good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We don't want a Mad Max future. Um, (laughs) We want want a nicer future than that. And, uh, you know, that's a really really inspiring vision to work towards. Um, I also think it's dangerous to sort of vilify certain players in the sector you know, I, I, I felt really inspired when years ago I went to a um, sustainable restaurant awards ceremony and McDonald's won sustainability champion of the year. Now, there were some people in the audience that groaned and thought it was heresy to put Ronald McDonald up on the stage. But I say no. You know, Ronald has got the potential to massively move the mm-hmm. dial in terms of the march towards a better future. You know, and so let's not get on our high horses and say, oh, it's, everything about them is disgusting. They had the biggest cues that I passed in lockdown. <laughs> you know, we can, again, we can rage against the machine or we can say, look, McDonald's is there. It's a big player. How can we help McDonald's become a better company? How can that be a driver for change? And we're all for that, you know, whether it's McDonald's or Double Puck and everything in between. So... Yeah, there was an interest. I mean, just on that, was an interesting article in the Guardian that I read in the last month or so, which was around you know, the impact that Burger King and McDonald's could have if they did a blended burger across their whole you know, supply chain. Now, I know that's that's not really realistic in terms of they're not going to do that across their entire range. But if hypothetically, if they did, that would have reduced um, carbon emissions by 34 million tons. I think it was a year, and then a further 17 from their, you know, the land use impact. So it's like 51 million tonnes of carbon a year reduced from doing that blended approach. Now, I know that is simplifying it somewhat because they have got to protect revenue, margin and so on. But it's the idea that there are some there are some tools in the box that can be, um, you know, used. And it's not always this idea that it's a sort of either or. You're either a vegan place or not. You can, there's a, I think that's what we'd like to see more using the data in, a, in an intelligent way to just see how you can, I guess, defy the, the convention and, and make quite big changes. And when you talk about, you know, business of that scale, it's, it's change at scale, which is what, what we want to see, right? Yeah, it's global change if they move on the dial suddenly. What, what, what is, um, what is like, you know, you've gone through an extreme process and journey over the last year. You told that yourself, like, well, just quickly from, from each of you shortly, like, what have you been your, your most significant learning maybe in life or in business? Crikey, most significant learning in life or business. Um, it helps if you're doing something with someone that you, uh, you love spending your time <laughs> with. And, uh, after 14 years, Ed and I still, still love spending our time with <laughs> each other. And that's, and that's a real, a really powerful sort of uh, ingredient in, 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 in a business. Um, I think it helps if the sort of wins are with you. So product market fit, in other words, if you don't have product market fit and you can have the most uh, good business in the world with the best values and morals, but you'll be just, uh, you know, uh, swimming against the tide. If we had launched Zedible back when everyone was talking about straws and compostable cups, then this wouldn't have hit the zeitgeist and been received, even though it absolutely should have been because the elephant has been in the room for like ever. So getting the right time, getting the right place and uh, and doing something which sort of resonates with, with your own <coughs> values, I think for me, that's, 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 that's mm. crucial. Personally, as a part of the business, but then ultimately in terms of business success, you've got to be, swimming with the tide, ideally just before, so you can catch it and surf it in, which, which hopefully is where we are at. What, what about you, Ed? What do you think? Yeah, so I, th- I mean, you know, l- losing, losing Frisker back in, what, 2020, 2021, ultimately, um, it's very easy to sort of get the violin out. Um, and it was definitely a pretty, time zone it was pretty dark for us. But coming out the other side, you realise you're still standing, right? You still got, you know, in our case, family, kids, around us and so as much as it's hard you've got a lot 
more uh, resilience than you maybe ever thought you did. Um, and also you come out, I guess, more determined from, from that. And the other thing, I guess, is sort of, I often look at optimism, whether that's blind optimism or not, is a, is a, is a superpower to have. If you, you can be an optimist, then you can look at a situation and push through. Um, even when you get no's, you know, uh, I read an interesting book recently about um, some sort of, I think it's 30 very famous inventors from the sort of 1800s period. And, you know, some of the inventions that we use every day or derive from things we use every day, the number of no's, rejection, non-believers littered across all of these stories. And, you know, they had optimism, all of these people. Uh, some of them are nice characters, some not so nice characters in this book, but... The idea is that if you're optimistic, you don't take no for an answer. You see the, the, the silver lining and you, and you crack on. And I think that that's I certainly that was definitely underlined going through that whole process post COVID and coming out looking at a new chapter with a you know a, a lot of uh, excitement. That's some really good learning. You we had the you know uh, being together with the right person when you want to change something is important and you had the product market fit which we sometimes forget when we fall in love in an idea and then you had like the whole optimism part your obstacle is is the way as i often say because that's you know you need to see they're just there to make you into the person you need to be to to do whatever you set it out to be and last last two couple of questions before we we we, uh, we we have to to stop here today unfortunately but but one of the things i often ask people is because there's always one question i should have asked you but i didn't for some reason i didn't was not smart enough to come up with that question what would that question have been and what would you have answered um well we 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 always had a, we always finished our interviews back in the day at frisco with um <laughs> what was the last a curveball. of all yeah, a curveball <laughs> Sometimes you can have interviews where, frankly, you don't get a great deal from, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> again, leading to Ed's point, make the most of every situation. Ideally, we'd like to get something out of the interview. And so we would ask the question, what was the last amazing thing you read, saw or heard? Um, which sometimes can catch people unaware, sort of wide-eyed. <laughs> oh, good God, we heard some stories in, in the last amazing thing. <laughs> Probably, uh, what, what, I don't know if you've got an age rating on this podcast, but probably not one to mention on here. But yeah, what was the last amazing thing you read, saw, or heard? Well, well, I actually, I actually been. Uh, it's actually a book, and I've been reading it three thousand times in two thousand and twenty-two because I actually felt that was the year for it. I got it just before someone's called "Obstacle Is the Way" by Ryan Holiday. And if people hasn't read that book, they just need to read it to get ready for We Up Against. And it's exactly about, again, what we just talked about before, exactly principle about optimism, even though there's an obstacle is the way. And that has had a profound impact. I got it at the right time, at the right point, where I actually thought that we were trying to launch, uh, you know, really trying to get out of the starting block with the business. I actually found out, actually, all the obstacles we have now, we need to go through them to get there. And now it's okay. Actually, I can better deal with it. And it's funny enough, you always all evolve as a business owner. But that really book really had a profound impact on me last year. So that's actually one of the things that really, when you asked that question, I was thinking about. Mm. How about you, Ed? I would probably, I mentioned it just a minute ago, because uh, this must be at the front of my mind, but it's a book by a guy called Jeremy Collar, who's not, uh, I think he's a sort of finance background, but um, it's called Splendidly Unreasonable Inventors. It's about profiling about 30 different inventors, as I mentioned, just the mind-boggling stories uh, of people overcoming hurdles and achieving, you know, success other times where they completely chucked it down the toilet um but it is it's fascinating and um that's probably the yeah the has really made me think since i sort of finished that just after christmas well you you sent that link over afterwards and we'll put it in the show notes for people and we'll put an obstacle as the on the is the way is also in the show notes and what about you griff yeah i i actually it makes me sound more interesting than i am but um <laughs> i've probably got one for each of those categories the last amazing thing I saw, I would say, was a movie called Everything Everywhere All at Once, and it blew my mind. It is amazing. It made it makes you laugh, cry, your jaw drop. 
it's profound, it's stupid, it's amazing. So that was the last amazing thing I saw. Uh, most, the last amazing thing I read, I'm probably reading it at the moment, it's a book by Nick Cave called Faith, Hope and Carnage. Now, I've only read three chapters, but the first chapter uh, was talking about how his son died uh, years back, and he was talking about his latest album and how he feels that his son's spirit is actually in the music he's created. Not metaphorically, like actually. And I just read that and I was like, wow, that's that's super deep and uh, quite amazing. And having you know, being a dad now, that's, that, that, I can't imagine going through that. And then the last amazing thing I heard was a banger of a concert by this guy called John Hopkins, which basically he started on a classical, like a grand piano, brought in a string quartet and then just dropped fat beats on his um, MacBook, like on his mixing desk and whatever. And it was transcendent. It was amazing. Uh, so, yeah, John Hopkins tour, everything everywhere all at once and faith, hope and carnage. Well, you you have had that question many times. You answered so well, Griff. Like It's like a school book example. Uh, but great, great. It's so great to have you, uh, great to have you back and have you both on the show talking about Setable and, and the revolution you are creating or the transformation, let's call it a transformation instead. Um, where can people find out more about you and connect with you if they want to hear more about the platform, talk with you guys, have the, talk about the last question we just had. Sure, yeah, so both on LinkedIn, so Ed Brown and Griff Holland, and then Zedable.io, the website, that's best place to try and get, get free. Great. Thank you so much uh, for coming on and uh, sending you, you uh, both and the team power and energy to, uh, to continue the transformation. I really appreciate that you're listening in. So if you enjoyed today's conversation, please share with others, rate or give a review or subscribe to one of our channels, which all can be done via the website hospitalitymavericks.com. I believe that reading the right books is the key to become a better leader. So I've helped you with a curated list of some of the best books to improve yourself, others, and the organization. Find them on hospitalitymavericks.com. A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help leaders to become better every day. Check them out at bizsimply.com or on their socials at bitsimply or bitsimply hq you can also email them directly at podcast at bitsimply.com thank you to fina charlson who is the show producer from the podcast collective if you have any ideas and feedback for the show or other thoughts reach out to me via linkedin or via my email michael at hospitalitymavericks.com i'm michael tinkser and you've been listening to the hospitality maverick podcast show be maverick.